Well, welcome, welcome to the Headless Dam with Culinary Bootcamp course, lesson number six, an introduction to video and audio formats. Today presented by Max Mabe, Senior Director of Marketing at Cloudinary. If you want to learn more about him, I have a great interview with him where we chat about a bunch of stuff in the introduction section of this course on headlesscreator.com. So with that said, let's get uh, Max here. Max, welcome. Glad to have you here. I'll let you take over and I'll jump in with any questions. Thanks, Marcelo. Good to be here. Welcome, everyone. So in this course, we're going to learn some foundational pieces around video and audio formats. And I will say, once you start working with video and audio, things can become complex pretty quickly. Uh, so I think this course is really intended to give you a nice foundation, a good understanding of whether you're actually creating that content yourself, whether you're working with an artist to do that or a production company, you'll be set up in a way where you'll understand all the terminology and terms and be able to have a really good end result uh, for your project moving forward. So let's move forward and let's talk about uh, the topics we're going to cover in this section. So we're going to talk a little bit a lo about lossless and lossy compression, why you need to know the differences and why that's important when you're working with audio and video files. We're going to take a while, a few seconds to demystify the idea of codecs and containers. Uh, oftentimes people think that's very, very confusing and they don't understand it, but it's actually really, really simple. And it's, again, an important foundational uh, aspect to understand when you're working with audio and video. Then we're going to jump, jump into video formats and audio formats. I'm going to kind of break it down to the top three for each that kind of give you the best length and the ones that you're probably going to want to do some research on when you're creating content. We're going to drop in and talk about the importance of accessibility and get some tips around how to make sure your content is viewable by the largest audience as possible. And then we're going to kind of end at the end talking a little bit about some workflow tips when you're kind of planning that video and audio project. What are the, some of the things that you're going to want to keep in mind? Also, when you're choosing specific tools, what features might you want those tools to offer to make your life a little bit easier? So that'll be at the very end. And of course, through the whole uh, conversation, feel free to ask questions. Okay, so let's talk a, a little bit about compression. There are, in essence, two types. You've got lossless compression and lossy. Um, the name should kind of tell you. Lossless means that you aren't really losing any data from the original content before or after it's compressed. Uh, lossy compression means that you're kind of making um, some decisions, right? Or the way that you're compressing that video, there'll be some frames dropped, some data dropped. But in the end, uh, if things are turning out the way that they should, the video is still going to look really great when you actually view it. You can also think about lossless and lossy in a very simple way. Think about image formats. Uh, when you have the ability to take an image or create a piece of content, you can typically create that in a lossless format. For example, a TIFF image is a lossless format. A Photoshop document is a lossless format. But those are very large files, and they're great for editing originally, but when you're ready to deliver those or use those in experiences, they're really too big uh, to use on the web or to stream. So you'll convert those or compress those into lossy formats like JPEG, for example, or a GIF format. Again, you're turning down the quality to a certain extent, but visually, when people actually look at these images, they won't be able to tell, and the fidelity will be really great for those. The same thing for video and audio. When we are capturing video and audio, we typically want to do that in a lossless format, so we're getting the most quality as possible. Then we'll do our editing and post-production, and then ultimately, when we're ready to deliver it, we will compress that down to a lossy format, but still giving us the quality that we need uh, for the end result. Okay, so let's talk about codecs and containers. I'm going to go through kind of the official um, definition of these. And then I'll talk a little bit about the workflow and I'll tell you how I kind of uh, think about them in a really kind of simple way. So a codec really comprises that idea of encoding that video and audio and then ultimately decoding or uncompressing this video and audio when you're ready to play that back uh, in your target device. A container is really a package of all of that information. It's the video, 
it's the audio, it's the closed caption pieces that the um, Kodak is actually made up of, right? So think of it this way. The Kodak is kind of like a recipe, right? You've got your video, you've got your audio, you've got some other settings that will make up that Kodak. And then ultimately you're gonna place that into a container or maybe, you know, a box. And that box will allow you to port that video and audio around anywhere you want to any device. And that Kodak is widely understood and widely supported by a lot of people. Everyone can pretty much open the box and look at the video and hear the audio inside. So again, think of the Kodak as the recipe for your video and audio when you mix all that together and compress it. And your container allows you to kind of travel that around the internet to all kinds of devices and streaming platforms. So if we look at this workflow in the middle, you'll see that we start with your original video footage your original sound, and these are typically lossless, right? And then you're gonna combine those together doing, during the encoding process. You're gonna choose a Kodak to do that piece based upon the end result that you need. And then ultimately you're gonna wind up with a video file, right? And then when that video file is played back, we're gonna again use that Kodak in, other to, in order to decode the file, the video and the sound, make it look nice together and play back again, delivered on that universal Kodak or format that you've chosen. So pretty simple. And now we're gonna go in and actually break down some of the things you'll wanna keep in mind. And then I'll give you some suggestions around how to capture and obviously work with those file formats. Okay, so when we think about formatting, one of the main things, whether we're creating um, content or whether we're actually capturing in camera or microphone, um, is what format to capture. As I said earlier, we're typically gonna to want to capture things in a lossless format to begin with that will give us the most flexibility when we're editing and will allow us to ultimately get anything from a 4K output all the way down to something that might be smaller for like an ambient one by one ratio crop video that might be a few seconds. It's kind of looping on your homepage. So when we think about capturing, you may hear phrases like raw, you may uh, hear people say, well, it should be the proprietary format, uh, or we would love to have an Apple ProRes. All of these are ways of talking about uncompressed original formats. Um, for example, when you work in After Effects and you're creating an After Effects project or an AEP project, that's gonna be in its maximum format, lossless, which will give you most of the flexibility when you're editing. And then when you compress that down, you'll be able to keep the quality uh, when you're making some decisions around what that ultimate resolution will be in the end. Lots of cameras will allow you, of course, to capture in RAW, right? So you're getting that video shot, all the definition, all the pixels, all the quality in the camera when you're shooting. Some cameras will also give you the ability to capture video in a compressed format as well. And again, when you're planning your projects, you're gonna want to determine, does it need to be captured in RAW? Or can we save a little bit of space and go ahead and capture that in a compressed format. Oftentimes you'll hear people say, well, hey, can you capture that or can you deliver that item in an Apple ProRes? And the reason people like Apple ProRes is that it's lossless, but it's also very flexible. Most editing suites and solutions will allow you to open up that ProRes lossless file, be able to make cuts and modifications and not worry about uh, not having the quality you need for that original capture. So on the other hand, when we think about uncompressed audio, there are really two formats that we're working with. It's either a wave capture or AIFF capture as well. Both of these are uncompressed audio. And again, allowing you to capture the highest possible uncompressed quality, bring that into your editing suite and the end result when you mix things down uh, and together and compress it, you're gonna have more flexibility and the audio is really going to sound good in the end. One thing I always think about here is bad quality in means bad quality out. So you want to start with the best video that you have and the best audio that you have. And then you're going to make sure that you've got an end result once you start mixing and editing these and ultimately compressing those down for deliverables. Quick question for you, Max. Um, would you, what's your recommendation? If you know your target uh, delivery and, and that's the only place you're going to send it to is let's say TikTok. 
Um, would you recommend instead of raw to do just like H.264, which I know you're going to cover in just a minute, but um, or do you always recommend capture at the highest level? Because even though today you think you're going to do TikTok, tomorrow you don't know where it's going to go. What's your take and recommendation on that? Yeah, and I, I think it's a really great question. And we will talk a little bit about that. But but part of being successful, I think, with video and audio, which can be, as we know, time consuming to capture, can be expensive to capture if you're, you know, if you've got a whole budget for your shoot and you've got models and actresses and you know, all of the big pieces. Even if you're creating an exciter video for marketing, right? There's a lot of effort involved. So you want to mm -hmm. plan initially. And, and I think you make a good point. If you're a large organization and budget really isn't an issue, you would normally want to shoot or create at the highest resolution possible. And that's going to give you the most flexibility for reuse later and recutting. As you said, if you want to take a video that was shot in landscape and you want to change it to portrait later, right? That's something you want to keep in mind. If you may use it at a, on a billboard, right? Right. You may want to have that flexibility. But if you're just shooting um, as a smaller company or an individual, for TikTok or other things like that, you know, you're probably going to shoot in the formats that are available. So you're probably going to capture an MP4, right? And that's fine because it's universal. You're going to use the audio codecs and information that are a part of that uh, platform already for capturing, and you'll probably be okay with that. Another thing to think about is oftentimes people think, well, we always need to shoot at 4K, always 4K, but there's a cost associated. Those are much larger right. files. The lenses, the equipment, the storage cost can be enormous. The processing power you need on your computer exactly. for 4K. Yeah. The, the chutzpah you kind of need for your uh, computer to open up and process 4K files typically, you know, is not needed. So at a minimum for myself, I like to have things at 1080p, right? That means right. that if I'm streaming or putting on YouTube or TikTok or other platforms, I'm going to have the quality that I need. 4K is kind of like a luxury that really isn't needed unless you're a very large organization and you think in the future you're going to have to go ultra big with that. But typically when we're watching video on our mobile devices or tablets, you know, we're usually in that 720 sweet spot, right? right? So shooting at 4K, the extra cost is probably something that we can say no to. And we can spend that money on, you know, better quality lighting or equipment or, or more editing rounds. Or Excellent more. tip, right, which really is more important, people. right? Yeah. Which is yeah. more important, I think, to stand out, right? Yep, definitely. Cool, thank you. Sure, great question. So let's talk a little bit about post-production. And, and there are some terms that you may hear there. Oftentimes, people will say, well, do you have a mezzanine file, right? Uh, and you may think like, geez, wh what's a mezzanine file? A mezzanine file is really just a, a, a nicely compressed, uh, and, and universally supported uh, version of the original content. It's smaller, it's easier to move around, it's easier to make cuts in or suggested cuts, it's easier to annotate and, and move around. And, and so there, those are fairly um, common uh, when you're working with other people and you're, and you're moving larger files around. Uh, some of the file types that you may hear about, which, which are, um, kind of what I would call uh, storage files or final asset types that you might want to keep around so you can have that flexibility to recut or, or of course, Apple ProRes that we talked about before or Synform as well or nice archival files for posts and for keeping those originals. And also DNX HR is also a great format that has universal support. So these three are what I would call kind of like your archival versions of those projects after they've been completed. You want to be able to keep those in your archive so you've got full quality to do recuts later if that's something that's important for you. Um, of course, I've just talked about that final source for storage. Again, those are three options for you there as well. You're looking for lossless quality for recuts and resizing. And of course, you want to make sure that you can uh, edit and choose any codec that you may need. It's, Let's say that a new codec comes out that's really great. You want to be able to take that original source asset, use that codec to recompress it, and then go ahead and put that in a container and re-deliver it. So these are some things to keep in mind when you're thinking about post-production efforts and being able to have that archival original asset to recut. And also it helps you get more ROI out of your video right in the future. And when we get into the workflow piece, 
I'll talk a little bit more about things you're going to want to keep in mind when you're uh, capturing or planning your project. Okay, so let's talk about the top video codecs. Again, the codec being how you're going to actually compress that original size video and uncompress it when it's on your target device for playback. You may be aware of these already. Uh, you've got H.264, H.265, and you've got AVI-1. H.264 is really, really widely supported by pretty much every device and mobile device. It's very high quality, but keeps a low bit rate. That means that the files are relatively small, which is great for delivery. And you think about mobile devices that may have good bandwidth, medium bandwidth, low bandwidth, all at the same time that they're watching your video clip, that, that level of bandwidth they have may change. H.264 is great for streaming. Um, and the container for that, so this is our coda, the container for that uh, that it supports is MP4, which is probably the top format that you want for video. And then the Apple-centric format, which is MOV. The next iteration of this, HEVC or H.264, um, is an advanced compression format. I think you get probably 10 or 20% more conversion uh, overall. Of course, in, in their um, marketing for this or text, they will tell you that you can get 50% higher compression than H.264. Again, in my experience, that's probably around 10 to 20%. But again, depending upon the content complexity of your video, you may indeed get 50% more compression than H.264. Really works well for high compression. Uh, and it works well for high def video content as well. Again, same containers are supported, MP4 and .mov. Now, one thing people will probably be wondering is, I've heard that these require that I pay a royalty if I use H.264, H.265. And that can be true. You know, if you're a very large organization and you're, you're using these videos to make money in some way, that's the thing to keep in mind. If you're using these, codecs to make money, you probably have to pay a royalty. But if you're using it on YouTube, if you're using it in other ways, it's absolutely free to use, right? So H.264 and 265, if you're using it on these platforms like YouTube, there is no um, royalty for that. AV1 is a good option if you're concerned about uh, royalties. It's open source. Again, allows you up to almost 50% bitrate savings when you're, when you're working with video. It supports MP4, which is very important, 3GP, which is also widely supported on mobile, and MKV. The support for this is a little more limited than the H.26 formats. Uh, but still, it's a nice option. It gives you really great quality when you're thinking about device support. So these are the top three. If I had to choose one that I would use for my projects, it would probably be H.264, uh, potentially 8.265. I would probably stay away from AV1 unless there was a real specific need or there, there were specific devices that I knew supported AV1, which were important for me and my community to be able to watch this content. A couple of uh, quick notes on this. Also, I know on YouTube, actually, if you look at the stats for nerds, you'll see that uh, a lot of them are actually encoded into AV1 now because uh, of the open source thing. And as a Linux user, we just went through a whole thing with H.264 licensing where mm -hmm. they actually took off the uh, GPU encoding because they didn't want to, they couldn't, or they weren't paying for licensing on Linux. So. So those are kind of issues that you may run into depending on your OS and where you're sending it to. Good to know. Thank you, yep. sir. OK, let's talk about the top container. So we talked about the Kodak that's going to compress the video and decompress the video when it's being watched. But we want to be able to deliver that out right, in, in a container or a box uh, that everyone can open. So you probably kind of figured this out already when we were speaking before. but. Uh, MP4 is really the standard across the web. It allows you to get really great compression with minimal loss in quality. Most people won't be able to tell the difference from your original lossless file to your compressed file. It's got really, really strong compatibility about around all video platforms, including 
uh, YouTube, all the way through Instagram, all the way through TikTok, are all using or supporting MP4 uh, as the container of choice. You can also, of course, look into using WebM. It's a really, really small uh, file size. It doesn't take a lot of, of power. It's really great for live streams, like what we're doing right now. It's also open source, so, so there's really no um, worry about royalties. And there's really strong compatibility across all the video platforms as well for WebM. The bottom here, we have MOV, which is the Apple format. Again, high compatibility. Strong compatibility across video platforms, but it is unfortunately a large file size and it has the most compatibility around iOS devices. So if you're doing a lot of work with iOS and that's very important to you and that's your target audience, MOV might be a good choice. Again, if I had to choose here, I would probably go with MP4 because I think it's gonna give you the widest, most universal um, output and support. And it also has the right level of compression and quality uh, to make sure that your videos will really shine uh, across the web. And whether you're even going to use them in PowerPoint presentations or Google Slidebar, for example, MP4 is typically uh, supported there as well. Okay, let's talk a little bit about audio formats. Some of this we touched on lightly before, but Again, when you're capturing, you want to have the most flexibility in post. And that means that you want to um, capture at an uncompressed format or lossless format. Audio can be really, really tricky. You know, if you don't get a really good audio take, uh, it's very, very difficult, almost impossible in post to bring the quality back of that audio. You can certainly beef up, you can take the ticks and the pops out. You can only add so much bass, you know, to make some a, a bad audio recording sound good. And, you know, I think we've all watched video clips where the audio is just not really up to par and it can really bring down the whole quality of the video piece. So really, really important. Make sure you get a good capture. Uh, you want to make sure that what you're capturing is in WAVE or AIFF. So you've got really wide support across any other suites that you might use. And obviously, um, low quality in, as I said, means low quality out. You have to keep in mind that compression will be applied to the audio in the end when you're mixing all of this down and creating um, your married image and audio file. Okay, so let's wrap up here and kind of talk about in, in these format pieces, what's recommended. So there are so many formats, right? MP3, FLAC, AIFF. I've even thrown GIF in here because sometimes people consider that a video format because you can animate GIFs. All these have pluses and minuses and they can be pretty confusing choosing the right one. Based upon what we've learned before, the recommendations here for audio are for MP3 and MP4, right? When those are being delivered and for video, MP4 and WebM are pretty much where you're going to want to be when you're thinking about final deliverables. We're not talking about capture formats or lossless. We're talking about when you're ready to deliver those files out, what format does the audio need to be in for universal support with the great quality? And again, video, what's going to give you that great balance between compression and quality and wide reach when you're actually ready to deliver those final assets out. Okay, let's touch on accessibility. One of the things that I think is really, really important, of course, is choosing the right Kodak, choosing the right container, making sure that anyone who's going to watch it on any device and or platform will be able to play it. But you also wanna make sure those that are hearing or vision disabled have the ability to watch your content. That means that if your clip has audio or spoken word, that you've got a closed caption. And that if your audience is, is primarily English, but you know that it's going to be um, listened to in South America or it's going to be listened to in Asia, you want to make sure that you've got your subtitles for that, right? And that you've got the various languages that people can actually enjoy your video. If they don't speak English, they can use a subtitle and watch or see what's happening in Spanish, for example. Closed caption is basically for someone who is hearing impaired or doesn't hear, right? So not only does it include the subtitles, but it will also include things like music playing, door closes, or other activities that are happening that they may not be able to hear. Also, one of the things you may want to consider is including a transcript, right? 
Um, this can oftentimes be a little option on the page where someone could click it and see a time-stamped transcript of what's going on in the video as well. So having closed caption support, having subtitles in a transcript is really a good way to assure that it's accessible to all. Also, high contrast player option is really, really important. And typically, based upon the platform that you're hosting your video on, you have the ability to have high contrast players. And that just means that it makes it very, very obvious between foreground and background, uh, what buttons to push and what they do. The buttons might even be a little bit larger, but they really stand out and they're easy for people who might be vision impaired to be able to engage with. And also, of course, keyboard control. Your video should be able to be stopped and started uh, with keyboard controls. Obviously, if you're using a platform that includes a player already, a lot of those players already support closed captions, high contrast players, and keyboard controls. If you're looking to either build your own player or use a platform that includes a player with it, that might be customizable. You want to make sure that the above uh, is supported by that player. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about workflow. And some of this will echo what we've talked about already. Marcelo jumped in and we talked a little bit about the highest resolution that you should you know, capture it. Uh, but one of the important parts about being successful with, with video and audio capture is really pre-planning. Um, how long does that video need to be? Does it need to be captured in a certain format? Is 4K really required for that? Will the video be landscape in the full kind of you know, history or, or timeline that it will be available or published for you? At a certain point, will you be using that video for mobile, right? Is the video only going to be shot on mobile? So would it make sense to plan that and think about where you're going to put the text, what kind of models you're going to work with, if you're going to be shooting everything in a vertical or portrait mode for the whole video, right? Do you want to shoot it in landscape but be able to crop it later to mobile, right? Um, might you want to think about using titles on the screen and not have audio at all, right? Something to think about. Uh, so these are all things that you want to plan at the beginning of your project. So when you're in post-production, you have the ability to really create all the content that you need from vertical video to landscape video to formats like one by one for ambient mood pieces that you might have on your website or put into email promotional pieces. So really important to think about this when you're planning, not after. Again, capturing and exporting in the correct resolution. As we said earlier, shooting everything at 4K, capturing everything at the highest possible resolution, it's probably not a good idea in most cases, right? Big storage cost, equipment is more expensive, lighting is more expensive. They take a much more beefy machine in order to edit and cut and move those files around. Again, when you're working with a third party, whether it's someone that you've contracted who's going to be your videographer or who's going to be your production company, you're going to want to ask for or have in the contract before you sign and move forward to get a copy of those project files or at least a lossless Apple ProRes export in the end of that project. And again, that's going to give you that flexibility later to make those cuts on your own to make different versions of the video yourself and to get higher ROI. If you're only delivered in the very end of that project a compressed MP4 file and you always have to go back to the production company to get different versions, different crops, uh, changes done to those project files, it's gonna run into a lot of money. So if you have in your contract initially, hey, I get the project file at the end or at a minimum I get the progress, it's going to give you that flexibility to recut and reuse that video in many, many different ways going forward. Okay, there are a ton of tools when we think about working with video from editing to streaming to online commenting and kind of stitching that video elements together for your final piece. And there's a few things that you're going to want to really think about and that where technology can really help you as well. If you're planning on hosting video yourself and it's not on one of the platforms like YouTube or TikTok or others, you're gonna to wanna to think about transcoding. And transcoding is really kind of a fancy word for saying, hey, here's my original video. And I know that 
you know, it's going to be looked at on lots of different devices, lots of different uh, formats and standards, uh, bit rates, and I want to make sure that my video is accessible widely to everyone. Automatic transcoding is great. You upload your original final asset and video, and then it will automatically transcode or make any number of sizes to give you maximum support across all platforms and all devices. So it'll have a list of all the different codecs that we'll choose and containers, and it will make all of those various sizes and, and different qualities and codecs and formats to make sure that you have the widest support, right? And once you have automatically transcoded all of those different sizes and they'll set up in the cloud somewhere, it will then of course allow automatic bit rate or adaptive bit rate streaming. So that means if you've got an intelligent video player, it will be listening for or looking for the bandwidth changes or the type of device that that content is hitting. It will automatically adapt that bit rate or the quality of that video as it's streaming. So that means you won't have stutters, you won't have slow starting. It's using intelligence to be able to figure out, hey, the bandwidth's going up and down. And at that time, it will actually adapt go back to that transcode folder of different qualities and will automatically adapt that video uh, live while it's being streamed to those devices. And that means that that video will always look great when you have those bandwidth fluctuations and also look great on the different devices and platforms it's being delivered to. Something that we've been talking about a little bit is a video player. Obviously, if you are publishing your video to a platform, the video player is included. But if it's on your website uh, or on your properties, you may probably need your own video player. So you wanna make sure that your video player is customizable, right? And that it's intelligent. Intelligent is important because if you're looking to do a adaptive bitrate streaming where it's automatically detecting the device and adjusting the quality of the video in real time, your player has to support that, right? Another thing to think about when you're, when you're looking uh, for a video platform or video solution is, is their player customizable? Can you change the chrome, we call it, or the look, feel, or the buttons? Does that player, of course, have the accessibility features that we talked about earlier? Does it support closed caption VTT files and subcaptions and other pieces? Um, is there an ability to even go into the player and, and choose a different language to change the subtitle as well? Does it allow you to support different video resolutions? Four by three, one by one, 16 by nine. And can you even go ahead and have it play video where there is no Chrome around it? that will loop, right? So these, these are things you're gonna to wanna to look for when you're thinking about a video player uh, for your own website, when you're going to kind of host your own video or have a third party host and use your own player. Another important piece is this idea of self-service, right? You've got potentially your original format video or you've got a high quality compressed version and you wanna be able to make some variations of that. You want to either crop it or you want to vignette it or you want to have it fade in or fade out or you want to clip the video to a short and shorter a version. You don't necessarily want to have to go to back to your graphic artist in house or go back to your production company. So having a video suite or digital asset management solution, for example, that will allow you to do self-serve video variation is really, really important. Right, to be able to self-serve, to take that original video and recut it for YouTube, to recut it for TikTok, to recut it for uh, a third party uh, partner who's asked for a certain um, timestamp in the video. It's really, really an important part of reuse. And when you're looking for all of these pieces that we've talked about in workflow, you wanna keep um, self-service variation in mind. So I think this brings us to the end of our talk, and I hope that you've learned some great things here. And certainly, I've enjoyed doing this. Uh, and thank you for everyone who asked questions. Max, that was amazing. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Really good job. Um, if people want to get a hold of you, that email you have right there is the best. Absolutely. Yeah, they can. They can email me. Happy to continue the conversation and uh, talk about other things. Awesome. Thank you so much. And thanks to the rest of you. I hope you enjoyed watching 
uh, this lesson and remember to continue your journey learning all about digital asset management systems uh, by watching the next lesson which is coming up in a couple of weeks also if you want to get your knowledge certification make sure you use the study guide for this lesson which you can find in the bonus section of this course and as always there's my email address marcelo at headlesscreator.com send me questions or just get in touch with me so until the next one have a great one everybody